Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. In today's lecture Dr. Mani is going to talk about hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is a statistical method that is used in making a statistical decisions using experimental data. Hypothesis testing is basically an assumption that we make about the population parameters. Today's lecture will also explain you about null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis and then Dr. Mani will talk about the p value and the power of a test. Further he will give you a brief idea about false negative test, the type 1 error when we reject the null hypothesis although that hypothesis was true, what is the false positive test which is the type 2 errors when we accept the null hypothesis but it is false. So, there are many considerations for hypothesis testing which I think is very crucial to learn as you are going along in generating big omics data sets. It is important also to understand the various statistical tests and ways to look at your data analysis much more carefully. Let us welcome Dr. Mani for his today's lecture. The next topic I wanted to uh, address was uh, hypothesis testing. So, this addresses uh, questions about I have a marker that has some observed values in my cancer samples and some other values in my uh, normal samples. Is it a differential marker? Um, so, questions like that fall into hypothesis testing. I will give a brief kind of formal overview uh, and then give you some examples and what kind of tests you can use. There are a lot of slides, um, I am not going to go over most of them, I uh, will just try to restrict it to like a small subset. Uh, so, we can have more time for discussion and uh, kind of trying to uh, give a more practical overview. So, hypothesis testing is use of evidence to come to a conclusion in some way. So, I, I usually use uh, some uh, I don't know reasonable real world example. One, one um, uh, kind of thing you can look at is you, you are in a court of law and you want to decide whether somebody is guilty or not. So, in general the defendant is innocent until proven guilty and so innocence is considered a null hypothesis. In other words that is the standard hypothesis that is what is usually expected to be true in the world. Uh, and if you have strong evidence beyond reasonable doubt that the uh, defendant is not innocent, then you kind of accept the alternate hypothesis that they are guilty. So, in a cancer setting null hypothesis would mean that the gene or protein you are looking at is not a marker and alternate hypothesis would be that your gene or protein is a marker for the distinction you want to make. So, there is the hypothesis you are making and then there is actual truth in the uh, world that you are in. So, the hypotheses are the null hypothesis is always represented as H naught that the person is innocent that is the null hypothesis that the person is guilty is the alternate hypothesis. But then in reality the person may be actually innocent or actually guilty. So, we do not know that we do not know the state of reality we are trying to do a test to kind of deduce what the state in reality would be based on some evidence we have seen. We do not know the truth and so it results in a 2 by 2 table basically. So, the state in of nature or the actual truth is that H naught is true. In other words one possibility is that the person is really innocent and the other uh, possibility is that the person is not innocent. So, those are the two uh, su situations that can happen in reality that that is the truth and when you make your. So, you look at some evidence you do some test you do some calculation or whatever and you come up with a decision to say you reject H naught. In other words you say the person is um, not innocent or you fail to reject H naught. In other words you do not have evidence to say that the person is not innocent. So, those are you the decisions you can make based on the analysis you have done and so you have a 2 by 2 table which so, suppose you can reject H naught in other words you think you have enough evidence to say 
that the person is not innocent. If you did that and the person was actually innocent, then you are going to jail an innocent person. So this is an error. Similarly here, if the person was not innocent and you said the person is not innocent, you jailed a guilty person and that is fine, that is correct. So similarly here for the bottom row, the op options are you release an innocent person which is the correct thing to do or you release a guilty person which is not the right thing to do. So these two diagonal cells are errors. So this is a false positive, this is a false negative, the other two are, are correct. So if we look at the full table, this is called a type 1 error, this is called a type 2 error in statistics and you derive your p value based on your type 1 error. So the type 1 error gives you the probability that you reject H0. In other words, the probability that you say the person is guilty given that the person is innocent. So in other words, the probability of a false positive is represented by alpha and that is called the p-value of a test. So the test is whatever you are doing to come up with the conclusion whether the person is guilty or not or in your marker case whether a protein is a marker or not. And the p-value is given by, by that probability. And the, uh, the probability of a type 2 error is when you uh, fail to reject H0. In other words, you have a marker that is really a marker but your test is not strong enough to find the marker. So that is uh, the, the, the probability B and the power of a test is how well can you find those markers. If there is a marker, what is the probability that you will find the marker? So that is like 1 minus the, the uh, error rate is, is called the power of a statistical test. So in general, when you uh, do these statistical tests, you want alpha to be as small as possible. In other words, you do not want false positives, but you want the power to be as large as possible. In other words, if there is a marker, you want to be able to find it. So that is kind of the goal of how you do a test and uh, the power of a test especially depends on how many samples you have. So if you are using um, a test with a specific value of alpha, what probability you have of uh, uh, finding a marker that is a real marker depends on how many samples you have. And so many times when, when you look at uh, study design or when you are designing a study with uh, uh, patients and stuff like that, you will need to know how many patients you want and then that depends on what power you want to achieve in your uh, study. So do you want to find all 80 percent of uh, markers? that have at least a two-fold difference. And then based on some calculations, you can come up with how many samples do I need to achieve that. So that is where the power is most commonly used. But in a discovery-like setting where the number of samples is fixed by extraneous uh, forces like how much money you have to spend on the project, how many samples you have access to, uh, how, much, how many postdocs you have to run your samples and things like that. then the number is usually fix, fixed by other uh, factors. In that case, you just look at the power, the p-value of a test to figure out how good your markers are. And there you kind of just take what you get. You can't say I want all markers with or some percentage of markers with some characteristics. That's not possible in a discovery study, which most of the CPTAC studies are discovery studies. So um, I mentioned p-values, so actually there might be one more. So, so in hypothesis testing what you do need to do is you need to first define a null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis. So if you are doing uh, finding differential markers, the null hypothesis is that the marker is not different between the groups you are looking at and the alternate hypothesis is the marker is different. This is important in many situations but for marker analysis maybe not. But in many other situations, you have to be clear on what your null hypothesis is and what your alternate hypothesis is before you go ahead and do a lot of the analysis. Otherwise, you tend to tune your null hypothesis to your convenience, which is not a good thing to do. Once you have defined that, you define a test statistic. So that is based on the test you pick. If you pick the t-test, 
there is the T statistic. If you pick the rank test, there is the W statistic. So, there is a statistic which is a number you calculate using the data. So, the high null and alternate hypothesis are defined using population parameters. It uses the entire universe you are looking at to define the parameters. So, you can say this is a marker in my population having cancer and no cancer, not just the samples you are looking at. So, that is the way you define your hypotheses. But once you have that, you calculate a test statistic only using the data you have because that is all you have to make your decision. So, the test statistic is data specific and then you have some kind of a rejection criteria. So, you say if my p value is less than 0 0.05, I am going to reject the null hypothesis and say this is a marker. So, for some protein your p value is 0 0.003, then that is below the threshold that you set and so because of that it is a marker. So, you, you need a specific alternate and null hypothesis clearly defined that the test you pick will specify the test statistic and you need to pick a rejection region which is the p value cutoff that you need. And in uh, ideal world all these would be done before you do any analysis. <clears throat> and so, when you run a test you get a p value and this is like a cartoon that kind of says how people generally interpret p values. So, a p value is the um, uh, is the probability of a false positive. In a situation where you are looking at lots and lots of markers with lots of noisy data with not too many samples per uh, protein you are looking at, many times the p value is just a ranking mechanism. So, it ranks your markers in order of importance on how good a marker they are for whatever group you are trying to separate. So, uh, many times people tend to assign more significance to a p value and that can result you may uh, the threshold of 0 0.05 is many times considered sacred. So, what if it was 0.49 or was, was 0.51 is it significant or not? And so, um, we generally tend to use p values as a ranking mechanism. It is fine if it is less than 0.05 or if it is very small then it is good, but many situations if you have a, a, a small number of samples and noisy data many of your p values will not be uh, statistically significant. And uh, these are, I will also talk about multiple testing correction. So, ad, when you do multiple testing correction, you have to adjust your p values. So, if many times your regular p values will be significant, in other words, less than 0.05, but your adjusted p values will not be. So, in those cases, are you going to say you do have no markers or what do you do? So, in those situations, we generally tend to just use the adjusted p values ranking mechanism. I will get to it again later, but I thought we were worth mentioning here. I uh, can skip these. So, this slide uh, summarizes the types of errors and uh, basically gives names for each of the um, items in. So, like I said, uh, this is a false positive, this is a false negative. So, true positive, true negative and using these numbers you can calculate many different uh, characteristics of your test. So, you might have heard things like sensitivity and specificity of a test or the positive predictive value or negative predictive value of a test. They are all defined based on this table. So, when you have actual samples, each of these cells will have numbers in them. So, how many false positives did you have? I had 5. How many true positives? 50. How many true negatives? Some number. So, based on the number of samples you have each of these cells will be filled with some uh, uh, counts and using those counts you can calculate all these various uh, characteristics of your test. And many times you will encounter things like that and people will say oh my test is very sensitive but not specific and vice versa and in some situations it may be good in some situations it may not be good. It depends on, on how you what, what your question is and what you are analyzing. But this is to kind of show that how to calculate these numbers. And I think if you actually go to Wikipedia, there is a, a bigger version of this table with way more values included. There are all kinds of variants that people calculate which you can uh, uh, take a look at. So, just an example for false positives and false negatives. <coughs> 
I guess nobody. <laughs> so um, once, once you have the concept of hypothesis testing and you want to find markers, then the question arises, so what is my test? In other words, how do I calculate my test statistic? And that depends on which test you use. So there are many tests you can use and they fall into two major categories. One is called a parametric test. So here you assume that the data follows some kind of a statistical distribution like a normal distribution or some other uh, T distribution, some uh, statistically defined distribution. And you use the characteristics of that distribution to come up with the statistic and the rejection threshold. So because of that even if you have fewer number of samples, because you are assuming the distribution you can calculate these numbers relatively robustly and you can do the test. But many times uh, you may not want to make the assumption that your data is normally distributed or has a T distribution. In those cases you would end up using a non-parametric test. So in a non-parametric test you calculate a number based on the data you have seen like you rank your data and see how many are uh, uh, below a specific rank and above a specific rank. So you can compare ranks. So when you do things like that you have a non-parametric test. But if you have small numbers of samples, uh, generally a non-parametric test has less statistical power because you, you, you have to calculate more things. So you end up getting less statistical power and the variation in the data is can't be like um, easily taken into a kind of account by the, the, the statistical distributions that you could have used if you did a parametric uh, um, test. So both have their applications and uh, you use them in, in different settings. When you have relatively larger number of samples like more than 25 or 30, you can use a parametric test. If you have small numbers of samples, uh, very small numbers of samples, then a non-parametric test will not work. You will not get anything significant. So then you may still go and try a parametric test. But if, uh, if you have like 10 or 15 samples and you are worried about the distribution, you might use a non-parametric test. So uh, again here you, you have to base it, uh, you have to base the choice on experience and the actual uh, problem you are looking at. So like I have been mentioning that finding uh, up or down regulated peptides is one of the applications of hypothesis testing. Uh, I think we have looked at uh, all these. Basically, we, the main thing here is you need to log transform data so it ha has a reasonable distribution uh, and you can apply this to proteins, peptides, genes, anything you are interested in. So I have some examples of different types of uh, um, scenarios and what kind of tests you would use. So you have a case versus control study where you want to know, you have taken the log of the ratio of case to control, the logarithm of that ratio and you want to see which uh, uh, proteins are statistically different. So in this case you have a single ratio you have measured for all the patients and you have to come up with a, a measure of whether that protein was different in the cases versus controls. The second one is comparing multiple conditions. So you have condition A and condition B and you also have a control. So this is the situation we would encounter in like the TMT study. So the control would be the reference and the A and B would be like breast cancer subtypes or, or whatever. So you have log ratios to some common control. In our case it was the reference but if you had a normal sample and you want to see how things are different in basal versus luminal cancer with respect to normals, the controls could be the normal samples and A would be basal and B would be luminal. So you can set this up however you want based on the study you are looking at and the experiment you are doing. The other option is multiple group comparison. So I have 5 PAM50 groups for breast cancer. Can I find a marker that is different in any one of those groups? So that is a multi-group uh, problem. And so for each of these groups you would do a different kind of test. So for this you would do a one sample t-test. So the t-test is one way of checking whether the mean of two things is different or not. In this case you are checking whether the mean is different from 0, the, the log ratio is different from 0. If it is different from 0 then it is either up in the case or up in the control depending on whether the ratio is positive or negative, the log ratio is positive or negative. 
if you are comparing two conditions you would have a two sample t test. Uh, for multi group comparison there is this thing called a f test, but if the multiple groups arise from something like a time series. So, suppose you have the same sample you measure at time 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, hours or days or whatever, then the samples are related they are not independent. So, it is one thing to measure 5 different uh, breast cancer subtypes because they are completely independent samples. But if you took the same uh, sample and measured it 5 times at different time points and you had 50 replicates of this. So, you have 50 different mice and for each mouse you measure something at time 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. So, now you have 5 groups and many different samples, but the groups are all related because they were measured on the same thing. So, they are correlated and so in that case you have to do this thing called a longitudinal analysis to take into account that the measurements or the groups are related and so that requires a slightly different uh, way you analyze the data. An F test a straightforward F test is only if your groups are independent. I hope today's lecture was helpful for you to learn that making decisions in a statistical analysis include whether we should accept the null hypothesis or reject it. We understood that in hypothesis testing if the significance value of the test is greater than the predetermined significance level then we accept the null hypothesis, but if the significance value is less than the predetermined value then we should reject the null hypothesis. Finally, we understood how p value and power of test is important for hypothesis testing. Power is the probability of making a correct decision to reject the null hypothesis or when the null hypothesis is false. The p value or the calculated probability is the probability of finding the observed or more extreme results when the null hypothesis of a study in question is true. Next session we are going to have a hands on session about the software Protege which will give you an idea how to analyze your complex mass spectrometry data sets and then use many of the statistical consideration which we have talked in the last few lectures. Thank you.